Well, Shabbat Shalom. Welcome to the Assembly of Yah here in Marseilles, Illinois. Thank you for being with us. We pray that you are being blessed today, especially today, because today is the 27th of September 2014. It is Saturday, the set-apart seventh-day Sabbath. But it's also a double day because the, uh, the Feast of Trumpets has come to, the first new moon last night, has come to this day. So today, this is a double high day. It's a Shabbat and it's a Sabbaton. It is a very, very special and set-apart day. And it, I want to emphasize this point to you today, especially if you don't understand or maybe not realize this. The Sabbath is a set-apart day created by Yahshua to have fellowship with his people. He is master of the Sabbath. So when we come together on the Shabbat, it's really about Yahshua and seeking him and fellowshipping with him. The Father also, but mostly Yahshua, 80-90%. Today, it's all about Yahshua, because Yahshua made the holy days. When it says in the Old Testament, in Leviticus 23, these are Yahweh's set-apart days and moeds, it's not Yahweh's holy days. They're Yahshua's holy days. He's Elohim of Israel, Yahweh the Old Testament. Now, what makes this so special is that not only this is the Sabbath, the day he created for us to be with us, especially with us in fellowship, but also this is the day that is scheduled and marked in the scriptures and proven to us that this is the day that he returns. So this is especially his day, especially our day with him. Okay, so this is a double day with and double fellowship, double blessing, double set-apartness with Yahshua and us. So we're going to speak about Yahshua today because this is really all about him, the plan of salvation. Anyway, he is our headship, but especially today. So when we get into this message, which is, has to do primarily with the blowing of trumpets, Yom Teruah, the Feast of Blowing of Trumpets, uh, we're going to talk about that trumpet. We're going to talk about some basic scriptures that we need to cover for new people of why we keep this day. But then we're going to get into the main message. And the main message today is going to be about Yahshua. A very, very important message. A salvation message for you and a salvation message for me. Now, as we normally do at this time, we're going to turn over the program to Beverly for praise and singing and worship. And we are going to praise and worship Yahshua because he is worthy. Hallelujah. Okay, our first song today is it's the Sabbath day, and we go from that right to three rejoice. Seven, I see Yahshua. This is out of <coughs> Isaiah because we know that Yahweh of the Old Testament is Yahshua. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs>
down to number six, I will enter in his gates. <clears throat> Yeshua is what we're doing today. Yeshua is the gate. Yahshua, worshiping him, coming into his presence, our high priest, our deliverer, provider, and all in all. We're going to take time now for our prayer, prayer time, and prayer requests and such, and uh, be praying off camera. But as we always do, we would ask you, no matter when you get this DVD, it could be three years from now, uh, this is the 27th of September 2014, it may be uh, six months from now. It doesn't make any difference and it doesn't have any time with Yahweh and Yeshua. We would ask you to play, pray for James Hansen. Uh, he needs a job desperately. He's down in Kabul, Missouri. James Hansen. We ask you to pray also for everyone who is traveling for the feast and the feast upcoming and more feasts uh, in the next years for safe travel for all the saints. And David Kenders, a friend and pastor of ours, a uh, friend that is out in Loveland, Colorado, uh, is, has prostate cancer. He's suffering. He's very tired and, and sick. We would ask for you to pray for healing, mercy, comfort to Yahshua, our healer, for him. We also ask you to pray for my daughter, Cor Corinthia. Uh, she's down in Mobile, Alabama. She just got a job, and she's working as a nurse in the ER unit, which is very intense and sometimes dangerous, we ask you to pray for her, Cora Spencer. We say hello today. We wish you were actually here, but we do reach out to you and give you an embrace and, and blessing today. We say hello to uh, Beverly Smith that is down in central Illinois. We're going to see her in a couple of months on our way down to Flor our Florida trip ministry. Sally Foster, who lives in Westminster, Colorado, which is uh, very near Denver or a suburb of Denver. We say hello to her. We just talked to her and you, Sally, on the phone today. We say also hello to our very good friends, Sue, Susanita, and Clint Atterbury, who live out near Loveland, Colorado. I'm not sure if it's actually Loveland right now. Clint and Susanita Atterbury. We miss you guys. We love you and hope to see you soon. And we also ask you to pray for someone else. We ask you to pray for the inmates over at Putnamville Prison in Greencastle, 
Indiana. Uh, I have a group over there that I'm working with, and they get our DVDs along with Roachport. So we also say hello to those guys out there. Uh, I, probably some that are watching right now have never met me, and I will be back uh, from time to time every six or eight weeks. So we say hello, and we offer a blessing on the inmates in the Yahweh Yahshua Assembly over there in Putnamville. Uh, you guys are doing a good work, full of faith, good works, and we love you, we miss you, and we're proud to have fellowship with you. So we're going to take time off camera now for a few moments and make our request known to Yahshua and to Yahweh for people who are outside the assembly. So we will be back momentarily. Hallelujah. Praise Yahshua, our King. I want to ask a question today, and I'm going to say a lot of things that may offend people, but I know that you want the truth. I know you don't want it sugar-coated. I know you want to be told what Yahshua wants to speak to you today. I want to ask you a question, and I hope that this brings tears to your eyes. Are you ready today, trumpets, the day of his return? Are you ready to be with him? Are you actually ready to meet him in the air? Do you think that your heart, your attitude, your spirit, your understanding, your dedication, your walk, and your relationship with him is right? Because I'm going to go to this later, Matthew 25, where it says all the virgins were asleep and they were all in darkness in the night. None of them were actually ready to meet him. And that represents the assembly. That's a prophecy. So I ask you, and I ask ourselves today, when this is the day that he was supposed to return, even though it's not really the time, it's the day of his return. We know the day, but we don't know the year. Would you be ready? And I especially ask those in the audience today, do you know him? Do you really, really love him? Do you have a close relationship with him? Do you long for him? Do you languish for him? Do you shed tears in him because you miss him so much? You know, Yeshua says in the scriptures, and he talks about Torah, he talks about law, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. You know, if you love me, my words will be in you. Okay, but what he's also saying is, do you love me at all? Do you really love me? And most of us, I'm sure, in the audience would say, oh, yes, we love him. But I, I tell you the truth, most of us don't know him. And we're not seeking him. We don't seek to talk with him, meditate with him, and understand what he's doing, hear his voice. Yes, you can hear his voice. How can you love someone that you don't know? And why should you love someone you don't know? So we're going to go into that a little bit more. But I need to cover some very, very basics today for some of the new people that might be hearing this because this will be on the Internet on YouTube under our website, assemblyofyah.com, YouTube. This is a commanded day. It's a moed. In Genesis 1, 13 and 14, he says, uh, Yeshua made seasons, 4150, seasons, holy days, set apart times. There are three feasts we're commanded to travel to, but all the feasts are required to be kept because it's part of our covenant and they're a blessing. So let's go to Leviticus 23, 24. <clears throat> I'll remind you today that this is also a day of sevens. This is the seventh day, Shabbat. This is the seventh month. And this is the 27th day, today. And so it says in Leviticus 23, 24, it says, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, in the first day of the month, and I misspoke there because it's the seventh day, but it's the first day of the seventh month, you shall have a sabbatone, a sabbatone. That's an annual Sabbath, 
a memorial blowing of trumpets, a kodesh convocation, that's a meeting and reading of, of the word. You shall do no servile work within, but you shall offer an offering made by fire unto Yahweh. And that's Yahshua. Make an offering unto Yahshua. Because Yahshua is the Elohim of the Old Testament. He is Yahweh of the Old Testament. If you don't believe that or understand that, please send for the book, Did Yahshua Pre-Exist? Now, last night we went out and we saw the new moon. It was high, but it was very, very slim. And that was on Friday night. It was supposed to be out on Thursday night, and it, and it wasn't there. Israel didn't see it, where we take our timing from, from Jerusalem, as Moses did. And it was not Thursday. So we had to actually delay and start trumpets today with the moon last night, rather than two nights ago and start it yesterday. But I tell you a sad thing. Almost all the assemblies are keeping the wrong day. They didn't see the moon at all. Even their local moon, which is not the correct calendar. All the assemblies are keeping the wrong day today. They're keeping a Sabbath, but they're not keeping trumpets. Would they be there when the, when the shout comes and Yahshua comes back? Would they be there? They weren't worshiping. They weren't mikvah. They weren't ready. They weren't looking. Their heads were not up in the heavens yesterday. I tell you that very, very few are going to be there. A little more than ten when Yeshua comes back because the assembly is teaching deceptions, the assemblies are teaching lies, and the assemblies are misleading the people, and we're doing wrong things at wrong times. But last night we saw the moons, and so we went to Psalm 81, 81 verse 3. And this psalm is for the Moed there in trumpets in the day, the first day of the seventh month. So let's go to Psalm 81, verse 3. It is a beautiful psalm, and it's about worship to Yahshua, and it's about this day. It says, Sing aloud unto uh, Yahweh our, our strength. That's Yahshua. Make a joyful noise unto the Elohim of Jacob. Take a psalm, bring hither the timbrel, the pleasant harp with the psaltery. Blow up the trumpet, as we did a few moments ago in the new moon, in the time appointed, that's a moed, on our solemn feast day. For it was a statute of Israel, and still is, and a law of Yahshua, the Elohim of Jacob. This he ordained in Joseph as a testimony when he went out through the land of Egypt, where I heard a language that I understood not. We blew, the we blew the trumpet last night to sound today the coming of the king. Yahshua is coming back on today, a day like today. We know exactly the day, but we don't know the year yet. The trumpet is actually blown on this day. This day is actually called in Hebrew, Yom Teruah. Yom Teruah. And it means memorial blowing of trumpets. It's not actually a feast day, even though sometimes we say feast of trumpets. The word trumpet is used in the scriptures 60 times. Trumpet, plural, is used 44 times. Victory is used 12 times. And this is a day of victory, because when he comes and he raises us from the dead, those who are in faith, those who have a relationship, those who are ready whether alive or dead, when we raise, from the, raise up, we will meet him in the sky, we will have overcome sin, death, the devil, and all things by his help, our husband's help, to be able to reach him on that day and reign as priests and kings with him forever. There are many reasons why we would blow the shofar, the trumpet, in the scriptures. There are many reasons. One is for calling the assembly together to worship. Another one is warning, okay, a warning, which are short, short blasts. Du, 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 du. It might be a warning of some impending danger. It might be also a preparation for war. They also blow the sh blew the shofar in the Old Testament for the coronation of kings. The coming of plagues. There will be a trumpet 
play in the end time. We may not hear it, but they are called trumpet plagues, and they will come in also in the end time, the tribulation, the trouble of Jacob, to torment and to kill in the end time, getting, getting ready for Yeshua's return. Those trumpet plagues are essentially Yahweh's, our Father's wrath, but it signals also the return of Yeshua on a, this day. The day of trumpets, the last day of trumpets, Moed, in the very end of the tribulation, is the day that he returns. We know the day. The coming of the king of Israel, Yahshua HaMashiach, king of kings, master of masters, sovereign sovereigns. There are many reasons to blow the trumpet, but the trumpet itself, the sound of the trumpet, the tone of the trumpet, actually represents his voice. And he's signaling to us. And all of these things, getting the assembly together for worship, the warning, coming of war, coronation, coming of plagues, the coming of the king, all of these ideas and concepts in the blowing of the shofar apply to one person, Yahshua himself. They all apply to him because he's coming back to get us, but he's coming as a man of war. When he comes back, he's going to kill two billion people that rebel against him, who said, I will not have him reign over me. I don't love him. I don't want him. He may even, with all the movies and, and, and uh, indoctrination we get on TV, they may even think he's an alien because he comes from the sky. He comes in the sky. It says that in Acts chapter 1. This is all about Yahshua. Are we ready to meet Yahshua? It says in Revelations, the bride gets herself ready to meet him. Do you really think, depending on how much knowledge and, and fellowship and interaction you have with assemblies and people you know, do you really think the body is ready? It's not. He can't come now. The body is not ready, and more people are being called in by Father Yahweh to be a bride unto Yahshua. But when we will meet him in the air, when this day does come, our joy will be full and it will be a day of victory. Be a day of victory. Let's go to Psalms 98, verse 1. Psalms 98, verse 1. David is doing the Psalms and he says, Sing unto Yahweh, who is Yahshua. Sing unto Yahshua a new song. For he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his Kodesh arm has gotten us the victory. He has saved us so many times. He saved Abram from the five kings when he went after his nephew Lot. He delivered us from the hand of Pharaoh and the, and the, and the flesh pots and the torment in Egypt. Brought us through the wilderness, delivered us from Pharaoh. We crossed the Red Sea on, on dry ground. He gave us victories over our enemies and people and, and situations in the wilderness and saved most of us, but he had, to, he had to eliminate everyone 20 years old and over because of their rebellion. And he sifted us. He's constantly sifting the body, working with the body to bring forth his true sheep that know him, know his voice, and follow him only. Him only. The city of Jericho came crashing down. We defeated most of the enemy, most of the seven civilizations that were in Canaan, that we were given to overcome and given the land of Canaan, the land of Israel. Hezekiah's victory over Assyria. He's given us lots of victory. When we go to, when we go to chapter 11 of Hebrews, men of great faith who overcame and were given victories and overcame by their faith, by the faith of Yahshua, Yahweh at that time, but Yahshua, are listed there. Enoch, Noah, Abram, Isaac, Jacob, Sarah, Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, overcame, and many, many, many more. By faith, by f re uh, fellowship, by a connection to this mighty one. Yahshua, or David said in Psalms 110.1, he said, the sovereign, Yahweh, said unto my master, yeah, see, 
David worshipped, follow, followed, and knew Yahshua personally. He said unto my master, sit at my right hand till I make thy enemies thy, thy, enemies thy footstool. David, of all the kings, and, and aside from the prophets, David had probably one of the closest relationships with Yahshua. And then the disciples came. The disciples had a close relationship with him, but they didn't love him. Only one of the disciples loved him, John. John was the only person that had a personal relationship and loved Yahshua. And because of that, John was given more revelation, more knowledge, more wisdom, more insight, more end time prophecy, all, all the whole book of Revelations, than anybody else. The closer you get to him, the more you know him, the more you follow him, the more you give him your heart and your, and your relationship and love, the more you're going to get. The main reason, the main reason we're going to get into this, that the body today is not doing well, they don't know very much, they're not learning, they're asleep, they're looking for revelation, not finding it. The messages of the elders and the people who are speaking are watered down, they're plain vanilla, we've heard them a thousand times, and we go and we say, ho hum, well, yeah, that was the word, that's good, let's go to the buffet. Is because they don't know the revelator. We don't, they don't know the one who gives the inspiration, the knowledge, and the insight to give a message that has power, that has spirit, that has knowledge and wisdom that they haven't heard before to move them, to build them up, and raise up a faith that's powerful in their life. That is not happening in the assemblies. Because if it was, they would leave the assembly, they would go to the buffets, they would go to lunch, and all they could talk about was the message in the scripture in Yahshua. And you don't hear that. That does not happen. When you're moved and inspired and, and your heart takes leaps and your mind races in excitement, the subject, the thing, Yahshua, that touched you is a thing that you can't talk, you can only talk about, the only thing you can think about. The assemblies are not on fire, they're not inspired. Most of the most of the people, even people out of the assembly who are trying who are baptized in Yahshua, are not on fire. But it's still a day of victory. We hope to be ready when he comes. We have to overcome three things, but I'm going to focus on something in particular. But we have to overcome three things. I want to cover this. This is basic stuff. We all have to overcome the same things that Yahshua overcame in his three and a half year ministry. Even temptations of the adversary in the desert. We're in the desert now. We over have to overcome sin, death, and the devil. Let's go to Romans 6. Romans 6. Let's see what Paul has to say. Romans 6 verse 12. Sin dwells within the flesh. As long as we're in this flesh, we're going to have some sin, but we're supposed to be overcoming and doing better every week, every day, every month. And we can through Yahshua who strengthens us. Paul says in Romans 6 12, he says, let not sin therefore reign, have control, dominate, in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lust thereof, that you obey that, obey sin rather than righteousness. Don't let sin be the thing that you obey. Neither yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto, and I'm going to put Yahshua here, because that's what it means, as those that are alive from the dead, because he's raised us from the dead by his own blood and life as alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto Yahshua. Do you have G-O-D there? Mm -hmm. And Yahweh. We have to overcome sin, sin in our life. And it says in the scripture we can do all things through Yahshua who strengthens us, and also Yahweh helps us. So we have to get sin out of our life. Sin is transgression of the covenants and the law, the commandments, statutes, judgments, Torah. So we have to learn what that is. <clears throat> the second thing that we have to overcome is the devil.
Let's go to 1 John 2.14. Satan is always after us. His unclean spirits are always coming after us. Some of us have quite a few spirits in us. And that's a common state of man. Don't be offended by that. Most believers have some kind of spirit operating in them. But there's a spirit operating in the assembly, too. We have to overcome the adversary. The adversary is under Yahweh and Yeshua's control, and we have to overcome him. We live in his camp. He is the prince of this world, Satan, and he comes after us, and he hates us. He especially hates Judah, who brought forth the man-child. But we have to overcome him, and we can through the power of our relationship with Yahweh and Yeshua, especially Yeshua. 1 John 2.14 says, I have written unto you, fathers, because ye have known him that is from the beginning. Who is he talking about? Yahshua. I have written unto you, young men, okay, because ye are strong, and the word of Yahshua abides in you, and ye have overcome the wicked one. We have to overcome, just not sin, we have to overcome the devil. The other thing we have to overcome is the world, because the world torm, uh, pulls us with the lust of the eyes, the, the lust of the heart, and, and the love of the world, of, of things and goods and pleasures, and, and things that appeal to the flesh. The flesh lusts after the world and the things of the world. And the love of the world is not of the love of the Father. The world is someplace we are, but we're not of the world. Yeshua said, I don't pray that you take us out of the world. I pray that, that they overcome the world. He's not going to take us out of the world, but we have to spiritually and with an attitude come out of the world. We have people on our, on our list, our prayer list, who are dying of cancer. And they are willing to suffer agony, torment, uh, starvation, chemotherapy, radiation, all kinds of surgery, all kinds of uh, test experimenting drugs for months and months and years and years living in a bed, almost comatose, being fed oatmeal or something in, in their veins, but all connected with wires, because they're not willing to give up life. When in reality, death is part of life, and death should be welcomed because it is asleep. We're not to mourn as others do. They have no hope, it says, Paul says. And we are given an opportunity to rest and in that next moment be with our king and our loved, beloved husband. But they don't want that. They want to hang on to life with every tooth and claw, even if they're tormented. When Yahshua is saying, come to me, I'm ready to receive you, I'm ready to embrace you, I'm, I'm ready to give you sleep, and, and in the next moment you'll be with me. Come and be with me. And they say, no, I want to stay here. I think we should be in the day of trumpets every day that we're ready to meet him, and if it's our time, just let go. Let go of this and be with him. Does that make sense? Is there anything more important than Yahshua or being with him? There isn't. But the world draws us and pulls us and our families and our grandchildren. And oh my gosh, we're so plugged in to this moment of life that is like grass that grows up in the morning and the afternoon is cut down and thrown in the fire that we just can't let go of this. We've got to cling to this with every desperation. I don't think that's what the scripture says. We have to overcome the world. John says in 1 John 5, let's go there, 1 John 5, 1 through 5, Whosoever believes that Yahshua is the Messiah is born of Yahweh, and everyone that loveth him that begot loveth him also that is begotten of him. By this we know that we love the children of, of Yahweh and Yahshua, when we love Yahweh and, and Yahshua and keep his commandments. Yahshua said, keep my commandments. For this is the love of Yahshua, that we keep his commandments, his commandments are not grievous. For whose, whatsoever is born of Yahshua and Yahweh overcometh the world. This is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. And I'm going to put something in here. He that, and who he is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Yahshua 
is the son of Yahweh, his headship, his husband, provider, shepherd, deliverer, all in all. One that believes and follows Yahshua is what it's saying here. John is the only one of the apostles during that three and a half years that loved Yahshua. And he's talking about the love of Yahshua here. And we're not going to overcome the world, point number three, unless we love Yahshua. What is this day about? It's the fourth point. I think I'm on four. Overcoming death. Sin, death, the devil, the world. Death. Yeshua comes back on this day. We're changed in a twinkling of an eye, and we meet him in the air. Doesn't matter for alive or dead. Doesn't matter at all. I want to sleep. I don't want to see the tribulation. But I do want to be martyred for him. Maybe that's a conflict of interest. I don't know. But it's a day of victory over death because even if death takes us, which is only asleep, only a moment in time, it's not a big deal. We're going to come up out of those graves just like those who came up at his resurrection and went into town. Death and raising the dead, being alive from the dead, being raised from the dead is a simple act of Yahshua to do. It is simple. It's impossible for us to comprehend, but for him it's simple. Let's go to first. Corinthians, the resurrection chapter, 1 Corinthians 15, 54. 1 Corinthians 15, 54. So when this corruptible, that means flesh, shall put on incorruption, that means resurrection, and this mortal shall put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the same that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. The victory through one person, Yahshua the Messiah, our husband. Yahweh is not coming to raise us from the dead. He never did that in Yeshua's ministry. Yeshua raised from the dead. He said, in me is life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Yeshua is coming. He's going to raise us from the dead. So if your eyes, I'm going to introduce the next subject here. If your eyes are on Yahweh, you're in big trouble. And I know all of a sudden that probably raised the hairs on the back of your neck. What did he say? Our eyes are supposed to be on Yahshua, and that's what the Father said. So let's go on here. Sin, death, devil, the world. We have to overcome. In the end time, it says in Matthew 24, Luke 21, Mark 13, it says, said that when the disciples came to Yahshua at the temple, they said, you know, what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? And he didn't tell them the time or the date because he said it was in the Father's hands. What he told them was, don't let any man deceive you. And today there's a major deception in the assemblies teaching you to go after another. He said, don't let any man deceive you. So there are some victories, there are some things we need to be careful of, but he said uh, that many or others will come in my name and deceive many. There's going to be even more deception in a few years. As the time gets closer, there's going to be more deception than there is now, and there's deception even in the assemblies. The enemy, the greatest enemy that I see to the body, to you and me, is deception. But for those who have the spirit of Yahweh and Yahshua, listen and follow Yahshua, have a relationship with him, worship in spirit and truth, we know what is right. We know what we worship. Worship is of the Jews. That means that the Savior came out of Judah. I love the Jewish people. They're blinded. They don't know what they're worshiping. They have no sacrifice for sin now. They're in the ditch like our other ten tribes. Christianity is in the ditch. But they're all going to come in. Yahshua's going to bring them all in. He's got a plan for both groups, everybody. But I'm not offended that I worship a Jew. 
I'm not offended that I wear zitzis and it looks like I'm Jewish. There is anti-Semitism in the assemblies, and that's not the main deception. But there is anti-Semitism. And maybe, maybe in some small way, I'm not sure, but maybe in some small way that's why the assemblies really aren't following Yahshua. I know there, there are pastors and assemblies that don't like Jews, and I don't think they're going to be in the first resurrection. We can't hate our brothers, and we can't love only some brothers. We have to love all our brothers. But deception. There's going to be some that come, or one that comes, a false Jesus, or, or whatever you want to say, false prophet, and it's going to deceive many. Come in my name, he said. Come in my name, Yahshua. So let's talk about deception, because Yahshua said that was the main threat. There's another deception going on today. I want you to go to a very important verse in Revelations. Because we're almost in Revelations. We're almost in the time of tribulation in a few short years. So this, this Revelations is written to us about the time right in our period that we're living. Paul established seven churches in Asia when John was on the island of Patmos in exile. They already tried to kill him several times. He was talked to and approached and Yahshua came to him and he said, write these words down that I give you and give them to the seven stars of the seven assemblies he looked behind him and he heard a trumpet voice and he turned around and there was Yahshua. Yahshua's voice is like a trumpet. He will come like an archangel with the voice of a trumpet. So we're reading the words of a trumpet warning today and we're reading in chapter 2 verse 1 of Revelations and we're talking and listening to the trumpet of what Yahshua is saying to one of the assemblies. I'm telling you it's all the assemblies today. All these seven assembly messages go to all, this, all the assemblies all together, collectively. What is the deception in the assemblies today? Here it is. Under the angel or the pastor of the assembly of Ephesus, write, Yahshua says, These things saith he that behold the seven stars in his right hand and walketh in the midst of the seven candlesticks. Yahshua is the one in the center of the menorah, if you can see it off camera here. He's the one that feeds all the rest of them, the seven spirits. He's a, seven, he's a center one. Yahshua says, I know thy works, he's talking to the assembly, and thy labor and patience, and how that cannot bear that which is evil, and has tried them that say they are apostles, and they are not, and have found them liars, and has borne, and has patience for my name's sake. They have the name Yahshua and Yahweh. They, they know the names, and have labored and not fainted. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Folks, this assembly that was established by Paul, Paul went in there and preached one message. Yahshua impaled. And they turned away from that message, and they turned away from Yahshua. They left their first love. And he says, Remember therefore from which thou hast fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come, says he, he's coming, I will come to thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. What is he saying? You're not going to make it. I'm going to take your light your revelation, I'm going to take your faith away, and you will be blind, naked, poor, and destitute. I'm going to do that to you because you've turned away from me. I am your husband, your headship, the head of the assembly, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. I'm the head of the assembly, chapter 11. If you don't turn back to me and start talking to me, worshiping me, putting me first in your life, I'm going to take everything you have of faith and I'm going to take it away. And you won't be with me. You don't want to be with me? You won't be with me. I love you. I died for you. 
I washed you in my own blood. I long for you. My, my heart aches for you. But you've turned away from me, and, and I, can't, I can't have a love relationship with you. I can't marry you if you don't want me. If you don't repent, I will come and take your place away. This is written to us today. So we go back to the question. Are we really ready to meet him or have we left our first love and worshipped another one and followed another one? You want to know the other one that is preached in the assembly? You, know what, you want to know what the deception is? And this may be very uncomfortable for you, but I, I'm telling you the truth. Beverly and I go to all the assemblies. We've been there. We've preached in almost every assembly. We know what they're preaching. We know what they believe. We know what they're doing. And we know the direction that they're going in and their doctrine and their doctrines of men. They are preaching today Yahweh, the Father. The Father is greater than Yahshua, the, greater, the Father's plan is the plan of salvation. The Father put all this together. The Father is overlooking the whole plan. There's lots and lots of reasons why, but they preach Yahweh. It's always about Yahweh, 90% of the time, when it should be 90% of the time, Yahshua. Even the names of the assemblies are wrong. Yahshua is head of the assembly. We are actually his body, it says, Listen to the names of the assembly. Assembly of Yahweh. It's not Yahweh's assembly, it's Yahshua's assembly. Congregation of Yahweh. It's not his congregation. Y-A-I-Y. Assembly of Yahweh in Yahshua. It's not Yahweh's assembly. Yahweh's assembly in Yahshua. It's not Yahweh's assembly. Yahweh's assembly and Messiah. It's not Yahweh's assembly. You see how the conspiracy, the direction is there? We went through the Bible, one of the Bibles, sacred name Bibles that has come out in the last 15 years or so. Then we went through the one from Michigan, the uh, Word of Yahweh. Okay? It's not the Word of Yahweh. Yahshua is the Word. Right? The Logos. We went through the YRM Bible. And guess what we found? We found their doctrine. They took out in the New Testament the name of Yahshua and put the name of the Father Yahweh in approximately somewhere between 80 and 130 places. Whether they understood that or not, or they did it intentionally or not, they did it. So when you read the New Testament, you get this idea that even Yeshua came and died, and he said to the assembly, he taught the apostles, go out, preach me to every nation, kindred, tongue. You get this idea and flavor, this false idea, that is still all about Yahweh. And it isn't. Yahweh has given all things, all power in heaven and earth, all judgment, all control to his, over his assembly. He is the one who is dealing with the assembly, not Yahweh. We are his bride. He is our shepherd, our husband, our king. He's the one coming back today, not Yahweh. Yahweh deals with everybody outside the assembly. When we pray for someone outside the assembly, like unbelievers, we go to Yahweh. When we pray for believers, we're supposed to pray for, to Yahshua. Now, I'm going to ask a question again. Why do you think, maybe, just maybe, why do you think that Yahweh is more important than Yahshua? Why is it you think that maybe it's really all about Yahweh? I'm going to, I'm going to ask or state ten points here, and you choose. This is, these are the reasons why the assembly believes it's really all about Yahweh. 
There are even people like Bob Hopperton that lives out in Pennsylvania or someplace out east who preaches and teaches in assemblies that Yahshua is not even an Eloah. Yahshua created in heaven and earth, stars and all of them that in that is, John chapter 1, 1 uh, Colossians 1.15, and Yahshua did something out of, out of nothing. He created everything out of nothing, out of the spoken word. And he created infinity in outer space. He created infinity because there is no end to outer space. Only an Eloah could do that. And there's people going around saying that Yahshua is not an Eloah. He's not a mighty one. You can't pray to him. You can't, you can't worship him. All of that is against scripture. Send for our three-part message call, called The Four Visitations to the Tomb. Send for that three-part message, please. It's so clear in the scripture that Yahweh, in his great love and mercy toward us, has given his son to come down here and be the head of all this program of believers. But here's the reasons why the assemblies justify this Yahweh, Yahweh, Yahweh. And we still worship and follow Yahweh too, but 80% of the time it should be Yahshua because that's what the Father wants. This is what they say. Well, it's Yahweh's holy days, Leviticus 23. No, it isn't. That Yahweh is Yahshua. All the holy days are his. It's Yahweh's plan, so we really ought to follow Yahweh. Yahweh is greater than Yahshua. Yahshua said when he was in the flesh... The Father is greater than I. But Yahshua is still an Eloah. Yahshua came to proclaim the Father's name. So really, it's really about the Father. Yahshua came, tore down the wall of partition from top to bottom at his death to give us access when we never had it before to the Father. Okay? So they take that and say, see, Yahshua is saying, don't follow me at all, don't listen to me, it's about the Father. That isn't what that means. It means we have access. It doesn't mean that Yahweh is preeminent over our life. That is not what it means. But now we can go to the Father in Yahshua's name. And that's what most of the body is doing. They're ignoring Yahshua and going to the Father, using the name of Yahshua, anything you pray in my name, he said, to the Father he will do, using his name as a rubber stamp, ignoring him just to get to the Father. Well, Yahweh is the set-apart spirit, okay? The name of the set-apart spirit is Yahweh. We have his indwelling, so it must be about Yahweh because we have his spirit. Number six, the Old Testament Yahweh, 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 some don't believe, and the assemblies still go with it. When they go to the Old Testament, that's all they say. Yahweh said. Yahweh did. Yahweh moved. And very seldom do they ever say this is really Yahshua. They want us to think it's about the Father. And it's not. No one has seen the Father or heard his voice at any time. Number seven. They uh, do not see uh, that they're turning people away from Yahshua, they think that they are doing right by preaching Yahweh, because he's above all. And because there is so many times that Yahweh's word is, uh, his name is used, they emphasize that over Yahshua. Number eight. I'm going to ask you a personal question, as I ask the assemblies and pastors. You're called, we are called the bride. The bride is getting herself ready. Father Yahweh is choosing a bride for him, his son, his son, not, not himself, for his son Yahshua. So my question is, if you go to Yahweh all the time and ignore Yahshua 80% of the time, I have to ask you, do you want a daddy or do you want a husband? Because if you want a daddy, you're not ready to be married. You're not ready for this day. Some are anti-Semitic. There are assemblies in uh, Michigan and assemblies in Missouri, Yahweh assemblies, Yahweh assemblies, 
that will use a new moon anywhere in the world, but not Jerusalem. They refuse to use a moon in the Middle East and Jerusalem. So they keep a wrong calendar. All their days, 90% of the time, unless they're lucky, 90% of the time they're worshiping on wrong days except for the Saturday Sabbath. Another, number 10, Yahshua was an Elohim, maybe he was, they say, you know, but became in the flesh. Well, when someone is in the flesh, they're weak. The flesh can do nothing, right? Maybe that's an idea why the assemblies emphasize Yahweh. Yahweh's never been flesh, never will be. Yahshua was, and he became a little lower than the angels and became weak for us, became vulnerable for us, died for us. Maybe that's why they say we can't worship him. Because he humbled himself? Because he gave up his power, majesty, Kodesh position at the right hand of Yahweh and came down in humiliation and poverty in the flesh, as disgusting as that is? So now, what? He's given up all his rights to be worshipped and, and adored? Well, I, I don't know. But these are ten reasons why, why or possibilities of why the assemblies do not want to preach Yahshua very much. It's all about Yahweh. It's a deception. Doesn't it seem impossible to you that you worship Yahweh 99% of the time? Our Father, who is, is, is the ultimate greatest Elohim. Yahshua said the Father is greater than I. Just you could worship him, obey him, adore him, uh, pray to him, and you 90% of the time, 95% of the time, and be wrong. Be out of spiritual guidance, be out of the will of the Father, be separated from the one who actually talks to you, leads you, and guides you, and protects you, the one who has been given the the unmittable responsibility for you to think about the horror of this the the impossibility of this that you're following the one of the universe who gave his son and be absolutely wrong and in be jeopardy of losing your even your calling in this maybe Because the Father gave the Son to be your and my headship. You need to move along here. I want you to go to Matthew 25. This is scary, folks. Matthew 25, the ten virgins. I want you to read all that. Matthew 24, Prophecy of the End Time, and Matthew 25 is one chapter. This is a prophecy, it's not just a story. Matthew 25, he says, Yahshua is talking, and he says, Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps, went forth to meet the bridegroom. Yahshua is coming, just like on a day today. Five of them were wise, five of them were foolish. And the foolish took no extra or oil in their lamps with them, but the wise had oil in their lamps. Now, you can call that oil a lot of things. Love, relationship, the spirit, his name, because it said it makes an a anointing oil of his name in the uh, book of Solomon, Song of Solomon. You can make it obedience. You can make that oil anything you want. But if you have a loving, dedicated, marital relationship with Yahshua, you are not going to be lacking. 50% of these people, this represents the whole body that was supposed to be ready, who are worshiping the Spirit and Truth supposedly, when he came, half of them didn't make it. Half of the body is not going to make it. Half of the people you think are believers are not going to make it. Now that's scary. Four, but the wise took extra uh, oil in their lamps. Five, while the bridegroom tarried like he is right now, he isn't coming right now, they all slumbered and slept, and that's what's going on. 
all ten of them. The body is asleep, and they're asleep in the night, and it's almost impossible to wake them up. One of the reasons they're asleep is that Yahshua is not being preached. And at midnight, at the time appointed, we don't know when that is, but on a day like today, there was a great cry, a shriek. <sighs> Not a sneeze, a shriek. Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. And they all rose up, they all got up, they all trimmed their lamps and lit their lamps, but five of them didn't have enough oil they tried to get oil from the others, and they said, no, go to town, go and get oil. Well, while they left, they actually left Yahshua. They left Yahshua. They weren't there where he was coming to, the spot. They left. Now, wouldn't that be scary? He's coming, you can see him coming, and you go someplace else? He opens the door, the five go in, the five that were wise, and he shuts the door. When the other ones come back, they bang on the door, Master, Master, let us in, and this is what he said, verse 12. This is not my words. He answered and said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I know you not. I don't even know you. You don't pray to him. You don't honor him. You don't worship him. You don't depend on him. You don't trust him. See, when you love someone... You, love, you, you trust them. You depend on them. They are your main support. They, they are someone that, that holds your life together. If you think Yahweh is holding your life together, you're wrong because Yahweh will not usurp the job, the responsibility and office that he's given to his son. You think, like the Jews, that they're worshiping Yahweh but they're not. The Jews think they're worshiping Yahweh, one Elohim. They're actually worshiping him, and they don't even know. You're worshiping, and we're worshiping Yahweh, but it's really supposed to be Yahshua. And following Yahshua as our headship. I tell you the truth. Let's go to Psalms 95. And this is also uh, parroted in the same same tone and the same subject, the shepherd, Psalms 95, and as John 10 is talking about my sheep and, and being the shepherd. Yeshua is the shepherd of the flock. The sea is his, and he made it, and his hands formed the dry land, Psalms 95, verse 5. Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before Yahweh, our, ma our maker. It isn't Yahweh the Father there, that's Yahshua. So it's saying, let's kneel down before Yahshua, our maker. And he is our Elohim, and we are the people of his pasture, and the sheep of his hand. We're in his hand. Read John 14, 15, and 16, and 17. We're in his hand. Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your heart as in the day of provocation and the days of the wilderness, in the wilderness and temptation. This may be the wilderness, and this may be temptation, this may be uh, uh, anger for you, you may be very upset, you may have already turned off the DVD because I told you you're worshiping and following 80% of the time the wrong one. It says right here, even in the Old Testament, we're in Yahshua's hands. And it says, don't harden your heart against what I'm telling you. Don't harden your heart, as in the wilderness when we all rebelled against him. You see, Israel, his people, have always been rebelling against him. This is the same old story. We always are resisting the set-apart spirit. The set-apart spirit is telling us to worship and follow Yahshua 80% of the time, because that's the guy that's over us. We rebelled it in the, in the Old Testament, we rebelled in the desert. We rebelled in the New Testament. Annas and Savira dropped dead. We can't rebel against this. We've got to turn back. Ephesus, the book of Ephesus, or the assembly of Ephesus in Romans or Revelation 2. We have to turn back to him. 
We will not be raised from the dead if we don't have a, foul, a special relationship with him and know him. Know him. We can know him personally. He will talk to us. He will guide us. You can know him personally. He promises that. He tells us that. Let's go to John 10, 27 and, and almost finish up there. John 10, 27. My sheep hear my voice. That's not Yahweh. Nobody's heard his voice, seen his image at any time. My sheep. Do you want to be a sheep? Do you want to be the sheep in the, in the flock that's going to be raised from the dead? Do you want to be in Yahshua's flock because he's the master and the shepherd of the sheep? You've got to hear his voice. You've got to have a relationship with him. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. That also means there, follows me, that they're not following Yahweh. David didn't follow Yahweh. He worshipped Yahweh. We worship Yahweh and give him all worship, honor, and dignity that he's entitled to have. But he says, I want you to follow my son. If you do that, I will honor you and be with you too. It's not excluding. Please don't turn off the DVD and think that Elder Mike said, we got to forget about Yahweh, because that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying 80% of the time, it's about Yahshua not 3% of the time. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life. Yahweh doesn't give it to us. Yahshua gives it to us on this day. And they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My hand were in his hand. I am the good shepherd, and know my sheep. The other ones, he said, I don't know, depart from me. And the door was closed. I know my sheep, and I'm known of mine. There it is. My sheep know me. If you don't have a personal relationship with him and put all of your hope and desire and heart and love and dedication to make him the center of your life, you don't know him. And I'm pleading. He's pleading today, please turn back to me. Turn back to your first love. My sheep are known of mine. They will not follow another. We're not supposed to follow another. And in this case, it seems righteous. It seems right. It seems clear that we should really be following Yahweh. He's greater. But that isn't what Yahweh says. I've given my son to be your headship and be over you. They will not follow another. But in the assemblies, they will listen to, we will listen to the pastors and elders to follow someone else. And that's what's happening. The pastors and elders are telling us to follow someone else. It seems right. How can we be wrong when we worship the one who gave us some? How can that be wrong? But it's wrong if you make Yahweh the father, the center of your life, and not Yahshua, because he gave Yahshua in a metaphor to us as our headship and husband. So we would get it. The husband is over the wife. The head of the man is Yahshua. The head of the wife is the man. 1 Corinthians 10, it's simple. But we've been lied to. We've been in that, that frog in the cold water, and now the water's boiling, we're about to die, and we don't realize how much trouble we're in. Are you ready for this day? Are you ready for Yahshua to return? Do you know Yahshua? He's saying, return to me. I love you, I need you, I want you, I washed you with my own blood. Please, please turn back to me, and I will raise you in that last day. Hallelujah. The song I'd like to sing for you today is called The Servant.
song that song comes from the congregation of Yahweh that we mentioned earlier Panama City Florida Carol Jones Jones uh, wrote that song and she wrote it especially to Yahshua I want to give a another piece of evidence I know that I've talked about this on other DVDs <coughs> I just want to emphasize a point I want you to go to John 12, 26, because it's what uh, Beverly was singing about. <coughs> Anoki, Aved, Yahshua. Anoki, Aved, Yahshua. I am a servant of Yahshua. <coughs> Yahshua says, and this is John. John understood Yahshua and loved him. John says in John 12, 26, he quotes Yahshua, and he says, If any man serve me, let him follow me. Okay? Not the Father. Follow me. And where I am, there my, also will my servant be. If any man serve me, him will the Father honor. You want honor, dignity, blessing, all the promises of the Scripture... What I'm telling us today, what the scripture is telling us, is that we have to follow Yahshua and serve him. If we do, according to this scripture, Yahweh will bless us and honor us. That's, that's his perfect will. Don't you want to be in the will of Yahweh? Follow Yahshua and honor Yahshua and let him be your headship and your king. Fall in love with him. And, and we had a discussion... Do we have time? We had a discussion at breakfast today, Beverly and I, and I asked Beverly a trick question, but I asked her because she's a woman and women understand this. <clears throat> I said, uh, what is it that a man can do that gets your attention and draws you to him that you might love him? What, what can a man do, or what does a man do that really gets a woman's attention? I said, if he, if he just takes you out to dinner and spends lots of money on you, will that do it? Or, or maybe uh, he brings you flowers or, or sings you uh, songs and, and reads poetry to you. Will that do it? How about if he buys you a new car? Will you fall in love with him? Let's take it to the next level. I'm always taking it to the next level. What if he saved your life? Let's say you're in a car accident and you're bleeding, or, you, uh, or, your, or your heart has stopped, or you stop breathing, and this man comes along, pretty nice man, good-looking man, he, he resuscitates you, uh, calls the ambulance, and, and he literally saves your life. Would you automatically fall in love with him? Well, the answer is no, isn't it? You know, we tend to think, I believe, that the reason that we love Yahshua or could love Yahshua or would love him is because he died for us. He saved our lives by giving his life for us. <clears throat> I'm going to tell you something. That is a powerful statement. It is the truth. And it is a, a very, very drawing, humbling, 
connective type of thought and reality that someone would die for us and save us and wash us from our sins. <coughs> That's powerful. That might do it. But I don't think so. I think it's a factor. I think it's in there. All right, It's in the mix, 20-30%. But I believe the other statement that it makes in the scripture of why we love Yahshua. And this is important. This is a marriage situation. Because he first loved us. While we were yet sinners, before we even came forth from the womb, he died for us. How can you turn away from someone or not love someone that loves you, is devoted to you, given your life to you, and the only thing they want to do is, is marry you and take care of you, care for you, and, and do good for you? When someone loves you and they keep showing that love, doing things out of love, <clears throat> Patience, mercy, compassion, fellowship, uh, teaching, and, and it's all because they love you. I tell you the truth that that will turn your heart around, that will turn your mind around toward them. A woman can marry <clears throat> an ugly man. The hunchback of Notre Dame. A man can marry a woman who is short, heavy, nasty hair, and she, she does, she's not nice looking either. A, a man can marry someone that is not good looking, beautiful. The world puts so much emphasis on beauty. But we know the beauty is on the inside, and what that beauty is, is the ability to love and give your heart un totally unselfishly. That is the thing that touches us, and that's... That's the formula and the chemistry that Yahweh and Yahshua has put in us, that love is the basis of all of this book. There's only two subjects here, Yahweh, Yahshua, and Israel. And this, these two subjects sit on one foundation, and that foundation, the glue, the their very timbers that hold this together is love. That's why it says Yahweh is love, and Yahshua is love, and the love gift. I believe that if we have a, a true revelation of how much Yahshua loves us and wants us in his life and wants to marry us and take care of us for eternity, that should be the key that opens the door of our heart to him. So I ask you to think about that. Yahshua gave his life, died for us, but even as much or more than that, he wants us and he's waiting for us to turn to him and embrace him. And a lot of us are not doing that. Please think about this. Please pray about this. Because he stands at the door and he's waiting for us. Yeshua and Yahweh, our Father, bless you. Hallelujah.